morning, friends. It's fantastic to have you all join us today. And even though I cannot see your faces in this room, we can still greet each other. So jump on in the chat, say hello, and let me know where you guys are listening in from. If this is your first time here, let us know in the comments and one of my friends will be sure to welcome you. My name is Dulcie and I work with Youth with a Mission in Fort McMurray. We run programs with youth, families, and since January, we have been running a discipleship training school. Students have chosen to take six months learning about God, growing in their relationship with Him, and practicing this in our community. Last week, our topic was on hearing God's voice. And our speaker shared about being obedient and this aspect of like surrendering things um, in our lives to God. And she asked if there was a time we had done that. And it brought me back to my story of how I was asked to leave Canada. Uh, for those of you that don't know, um, I'm not actually from Canada, uh, right? Hard to believe, it's hard to tell, but it is true. A few years ago, I was asked to leave the country due to visa issues. I had filled out all the necessary forms, all the things that I needed, and even still, they denied my visa. And it was because I didn't fit a requirement. And so I left Canada. I was in the US trying to make my way back into the country. And during that time, I found myself in a conversation with God where he had asked, will you say yes to what I ask you to do, Dulcie? Uh, at that moment, I felt like God might be asking me to surrender my plans for myself, what I wanted. I thought I would be going back to Australia, I would be denied entry into Canada, and that I would have to give up my life here in Fort McMurray. Thinking about leaving Canada, it broke my heart, because my life was here, my friends are here, the boys I nannied were here. But okay, God, <laughs> I trust you. If you say so, I will say yes. Uh, in Luke chapter five, Jesus notices empty boats and the fishermen were cleaning their nets. And in verse three, it says, stepping out into one of those boats, Jesus asked Simon, its owner, to push out into the water. And so he sat in the boat, he sat in the boat, sorry, and taught the crowds from there. And this verse reminded me of that time God had asked me if I would say yes to him. So let's keep reading. In verse four and five, it says, when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, now go out where it is deeper and let down your nets to catch some fish. Master, Simon replied, we worked hard all last night and didn't catch a thing. But if you say so, I'll let the nets down again. Jesus asked these fishermen, these skilled people to do what they already knew. And that even though they didn't catch anything after trying all day, he wanted them to be obedient and do what he was asking them to do. Right now, I'm working on getting my permanent residency. I'm in a pool with other nominees wanting to be invited to apply for permanent residence. I love this country. I love living in Fort McMurray. And I really like doing the things independently with little to no help from anyone. I like to control situations that I'm in. But this immigration process has so many elements that are out of my control. And so last week, our class, I felt God reminded me um, of the question that he had asked me five years ago. Will you say yes to what I ask you to do, Dulcie? In this um, process with my permanent residency situation, I um, have not been involving God. I'm still holding on to the process tightly, trying to control the outcome. But I feel like God is now asking me to let him have his hand in it, to be involved. And I was like, oh shoot, God, I'm so sorry. <sighs> right, I will if you say so. Friends, a few days ago, I got an email from immigration. Instantly, I thought, oh no, I was too slow. I've lost my opportunity to do the things I was supposed to do. But that was not the case. I got the letter of invitation to apply for permanent residency. I got picked. I'm on the next step now. It wasn't because of anything that I did, but I surrendered my plans to God and it reminded me of verse five. But if you say so, I'll let the nets down. Listening to Jesus instruct us, just like he instructed the fishermen. And good news friends, Luke 5, 6 says, after they pull the nets up, this time their nets were full of fish and they began to tear. You guys, God is so good. So let's join together and let's worship. Hi everybody, good morning. Welcome to Fort City Church Online. We're gonna jump right into it, so please worship with us. So 
ghost is a fire holy flame burning wild burning through the night burning with the light of a billion stars his love is like lightning cracking through the sky burning through the rage burning through the pain of a billion scars is inside me Holy fire burning
of the Father until heaven came to live with me a rescue like no other you beside us and that you took our place and so I pray that in places where we have trouble seeing that in places where we need you more God I pray that we would we would turn towards you and knowing that 
you love us and that you made a way for us to have a relationship with you. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey there, as we get to that point in our service where we worship God through our giving, I, I wanna ask you a pointed question. Have you ever told God no? Have you ever told God, not your way, but my way? Have you ever given God the Heisman? You know what that is. It's a college football award that looks like, simply put, have you ever thought that your plans were better than God's plans for you? Let's be honest, we all have at some time or another and we're not alone. There once was a fisherman named Simon who had been fishing all night and caught nothing. He was sore, in pain, and incredibly tired. All he wanted to do was go home and go to bed. But Jesus told him to go back out to sea far enough that it was in deep water and cast his nets again. Simon, like you and me, thought his plans were better than Jesus's. He said, Master, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything. But here's where the story takes a turn. Simon Peter then says, but because you say so, I will let down the nets. The result was a catch so great, we're, we're still talking about it 2,000 years later. Can I be honest with you? In this area of giving, uh, some of you need to do just as God asks of you and let down your nets, just do what he's asking. You, you probably know the verses, you know, Prophet Malachi says, bring the full tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house and thereby put me to the test says the Lord of hosts and see if I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour down for you a blessing until there is no more need. The Apostle Paul adds, each of you should give what you've decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. King Solomon points out, a, a generous person will prosper. Whoever refreshes others will be refreshed. In other words, let down the net. Do what God is asking of us. If I may be so bold, God really wants to bless some of you today. You just need to let down your nets. I'm not here to tell you what the blessing will look like, just that the Bible never stops promising blessing when we're generous. For many of you, giving, though, it's not about money. It's really about trust. Trusting the one that wants to bless you more than you could ever dream. Trusting the one who gives you true joy and trusting the one who just wants you to flourish. Because somehow our willingness to be generous is connected to God's willingness to be generous back to us. How that will look will differ from person to person, but it's still true in some way or another. Are you willing to lower your nets today? Fort City can only do what it does because you trust God with your finances and give generously. And with this pandemic, it has been tough to experience consistent giving. Week to week giving is all over the map. I, I get it, some of us are fearful and we struggle with trust. So let's, let's just pray and Ask God to give us the courage to trust him like we've never done before. Will you pray with me? Father God, you call us to be a generous people. You use us to participate with what you're doing through your church. You call us to let down our nets and to trust you with all of our giving. God, would you help me to trust you with my giving? Give me the courage, the faith to be a significant giver of what you've given me. And then God, will you take my giving and use it powerfully for the transformation of other people's lives, not only in this church family, but throughout this city and beyond. Use my giving and bring light in the midst of this pandemic darkness. I pray in Jesus' name, amen.
Have you ever thought, I really want to change my life? I, I want my life to have a purpose, to have meaning. I, I, I want my life to have a positive impact on the lives and of others, on, on my family, my friends, those I work with. I, I just want my life to make a difference in some way. I, I think we all do, or at some time or another we do, right? Mark Batterson, a, a pastor in Washington, D.C., made this statement that I, I'd like us to grab a hold of. If you want to change your life, start by changing your story. That's good. I, I want to say it again. If you want to change your life, start by changing your story. Uh, a Baptist pastor by the name of Michael King uh, uh, attended a gathering of the Baptist World Alliance in Berlin in 1934. While there, he, he became very fascinated with the story of a German monk who, who had been the leader of the Protestant Reformation. He saw in this leader, Martin Luther, a, a passion to push back on the status quo religious establishment of his day that he just really resonated with so deeply. Martin Luther so inspired Michael King and King's deep convictions about civil rights and the plight of black Americans that he changed his name from Michael King to Martin Luther King. Michael King, now Martin Luther King, had a five-year-old son named Michael Jr. And he changed the name of his son so that Michael Jr. became known as Martin Luther King Jr. For the rest of his life, those close to Martin Luther King Jr., they continued to call him Michael. But to the rest of the world, he became known as Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., the, the most prominent leader of the American Civil Rights Movement to this day. The composer, uh, Johannes Christomus Wolfgangus Theophilus Mozart, that's a mouthful, Mozart. Mozart changed his names many times. The reason wasn't because it was such a mouthful and so long, but according to one of his biographers, he was just experimenting with different identities, with different ways he wanted to serve the world. Hey, I'm sure that you know that many of Hollywood's household names are nicknames like Vin Diesel, because that's way too cool of a name to be a birth name. That is true of Whoopi Goldberg, Elton John, John Legend, and Lady Gaga. We see this in the Bible as well. God turned Abram into Abraham, his wife Sarai into Sarah. Uh, the name change of Jacob into Israel was a whole lot more than just a name change. It changed Jacob's story into a new identity, a new destiny, not just a new name. Jesus gave one of his uh, apostles, Simon, a new name, Peter, the Rock, and then he attached a destiny to that name. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Jesus even gave the disciples uh, James and John nicknames, Sons of Thunder. A couple of weeks ago, I, I told you the story of the name that was given to me at my Roman Catholic infant baptism. My parents had named me Douglas Darrell Doyle, uh, with my middle name coming from my uncle. The bishop baptizing me, though, he, he wanted me to have the name of a hero of our faith, a saint's name. And so he gave me the name Stephen, so that my name became Douglas Darrell Stephen Doyle. I actually believe that the name Stephen given to me by the bishop of the Pro-Cathedral of the Assumption in North Bay, Ontario, was a bit of a prophetic move. From my earliest days, I, I've taken pride uh, of being given a new name, the, the name of a daring, passionate saint who dedicated his life to serving Jesus and even lost his life for serving Jesus. I think that new name was part of my being called into full-time ministry. Friends, who we are, our name, our, our identity, and, and where we take our identity from is powerful. It shapes the stories that our lives tell, and, and it brings God great pleasure. And, and today, I want to work with the idea that your identity, empowered by the Spirit, gives your life direction and purpose. And to do that, I want to take a look at the life of someone who turns up in the middle of the book of Acts, a, a guy we've come to know as Barnabas, but that's not his birth name. His parents gave him the name Joseph. He was Joseph of Cyprus. Okay, today is our second study in the message series we're calling the Wild Goose. The Wild Goose is the Celtic name for the Holy Spirit, and it speaks to the danger and the adventure that comes from following the unpredictable uh, ways of the Holy Spirit. 
the danger and the adventure that comes from allowing God to shape our identities and use our lives powerfully for his purposes. Following the wild goose is not always a safe thing to do, but it's the only way to experience life to the absolute full. And today, we're going to be taking a look at how the wild goose renamed Joseph of Cyprus to Barnabas and how the wild goose then empowered Barnabas to live out of this new name, out of this new identity. And it just totally changed his story, which totally changed his life. And it had a huge impact that we still benefit from today. The story of Barnabas tells us that your identity, empowered by the Spirit, gives your life direction and purpose. And what I want us to see is that God wants to do the same thing in our lives. He he wants to change your identity to that of a servant of Jesus who, led by the wild goose, um, all for the purpose of helping your life to tell a better story because of who Jesus is and who he's called you to be. Uh, To introduce Barnabas to us today, I... I need to take you back to the beginning of the church that the Apostle Luke writes about in the book of Acts. These first followers of Jesus, I mean, they were full out. They were all in. They were full of the Spirit. And as part of being all in, they they gave of their resources sacrificially to make the church happen. You know, that might be a bit uncomfortable here, but right from the beginning, the, the church has always been funded by the sacrificial giving of its people. Giving is worship. Giving is a way we participate in what God is doing. Giving is a way that we bless others. Part of the story we tell with our lives comes from how we give. Your giving comes out of your identity as a follower of Jesus. Jesus' followers are givers, generous givers. So that is who you are. Enter Barnabas. This is what Luke writes. Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostles called Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, sold a field he owned and brought the money and put it at the apostles' feet. This is a huge gift. Uh, The apostles are just overwhelmed by this guy's generosity. They, They are so overwhelmed that they give him a new name, Barnabas, son of encouragement. And that name sticks. And it's the name we know him by today. And this new name became his identity, his focus, his destiny, his purpose. He was a man of encouragement. And this included being encouraging with his giving. And he would go on to become a preacher, a teacher, who encouraged people to become followers of Jesus. And he was used powerfully by God to help build the early church. A few weeks ago, we talked about the Apostle Paul and and his dramatic conversion to the Christian faith. As he was on his way to persecute and kill Christians, he was struck by and blinded by light from heaven. I won't retell that story, but it all led to him becoming a member of the very group he was trying to destroy. I mean, he became a baptized Christian right there on that road. Understandably, a lot of Christians were pretty skeptical about the legitimacy of Paul's conversion and wondered if it was just so Paul could get into the group and destroy more Christians. Well, it was Barnabas who courageously vouched for Paul when almost no one else was willing to stand up for him. Paul and Barnabas then team up to plant churches and to grow and encourage these new Christians in the cities they traveled to together. They were a great team. You have Paul, this hard-driving leader, this missionary apostle. And you have Barnabas, the encourager, more of a shepherd type. They were opposites that complemented each other. On their first, what we call a missionary journey, they took along with them a guy named John Mark. This is Mark who wrote the Gospel of Mark. And as they continue on this church planting trek, Luke makes this interesting comment. Paul and his companions then left Paphos by ship for Pamphylia, landing at the port town of Perga. There, John Mark left them and returned to Jerusalem. Something happened. We don't know what it was. But John Mark bailed on his mission. He cut out early. Maybe he couldn't hack it. Maybe there was relational conflict on the team. We, we just don't really know. What we do know is that it, it ticked Paul right off. Paul is his driving leader. He has no time for someone who can't carry his own weight, let alone bails halfway through a commitment. Again, we don't know what the issue was, but it was big enough in Paul's mind that he wasn't taking uh, John Mark on any more missionary trips. He was, like, totally done with John Mark. 
Barnabas, the encourager, sees potential in John Mark. He's not just willing to give him a second chance. He's willing to put his relationship with Paul on the line in order to support and encourage the potential he sees in John Mark. Luke writes, sometime later, Paul said to Barnabas, let's go back and visit the believers in all the towns where we preach the word of the Lord and see how they're doing. Barnabas wanted to take John, also called Mark, with them. But Paul did not think it wise to take him because he had deserted them in Pamphylia and had not continued with them in the work. They had such a strong, such a sharp disagreement that they parted company. Barnabas took Mark and sailed for Cyprus, but Paul chose Silas and left, commended by the believers to the grace of the Lord. He went through Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches. You know, I love that God continues to use Paul and that God continues to use Barnabas, despite the sharp disagreement and and this really, like, rough ending of their ministry relationship together. I, I love that Barnabas didn't back down. Barnabas may be an encourager, but he is not weak, not at all. He knows who he is, he understands his identity, and with confidence he operates out of his God given identity, son of encouragement. Paul is also one strong-willed leader who was not about to be persuaded to change his mind. I I love that Paul knew the type of person he could work with, the type of person that would drive him nuts, so he built his team around those kinds of realities. Paul, too, knew who he was and operated out of his God-given identity, the missionary apostle. Hey, was one of these guys right and the other wrong? Or is it more complex than that? Can Paul and Barnabas clash with each other and both be right? What do you think? But you've got to love Barnabas, right? He saw the potential in John Mark and wouldn't abandon him, whatever happened on the, you know, despite whatever might have happened on that first trip. And I bet many of you would rather have Barnabas for a boss than Paul, right? Any of you who have ever failed when, when we failed, we, we, need a, we need a Barnabas, right? Not a Paul. But God uses them both. They both go off on separate missionary journeys and both are blessed by God. Don't you just hate it when you get caught in a relational disruption and you're sure that you are right and and then you see God bless the other guy? Happens all the time. God, what are you doing? That guy was a jerk. Hey, conflict, even in the church, is inevitable because we are wired differently, have different personalities, we, we work with people differently. And sometimes in our weaknesses, in our sinfulness, we default to our God-given strengths and that sometimes hurts someone else. Still, God uses both the Pauls and the Barnabases of the world to change the world. Is one better than the other? Paul is the driver who accomplished so much for the growth of the church. He, He wrote most of the New Testament, planted more churches than any other apostle. But Barnabas, he is not less important. I mean, his ministry is less visible. And in this situation, I mean, Barnabas picked up the body of John Mark that kind of got over, you know, thrown overboard by Paul. Have you ever been thrown overboard by a leader, a boss? And depending on the situation, it might have been the right thing or not. Maybe, whatever. The good news is, however that worked, God usually has a Barnabas around to pick you up and get you up and running again. We need both the Pauls and the Barnabases of the world. But let's look a little more at Barnabas and the special ministry God gave to him as a son of encouragement and why it's important. Barnabas is in Jerusalem. When word reaches the church in Jerusalem, uh, Christians are being dispersed all over the place now because of persecution. And out of that persecution, a church has been established in Antioch. Antioch is in what is now uh, south-central Turkey, about 750 kilometers north of Jerusalem. So this is no Jewish area. This is a vastly different environment than Jerusalem where the church started. I mean, the church started mainly as a, mainly Jewish really, but it's here in Antioch where the followers of Jesus are first called Christians because you can't call them Jewish. You can't even call them Jewish followers of Jesus. They're far from all of that. What we have is the first non-Jewish, multi-ethnic, multinational, multi-class church in Christian history. So, what's happening here? It's big. 
Sensing the importance of what's happening, the church in Jerusalem sends Barnabas to Antioch. Really, it's the Holy Spirit, the wild goose that sends Barnabas. And by the way, the wild goose does the same thing with us, all of us, sends us on mission for God's purpose. Well, that's what we talked about a little bit last week. The Holy Spirit, the wild goose, is all about empowering you to serve God. He takes who you are, the identity that God has for you, the name that God has given you, and he uses you for his purpose. And you're here in Fort McMurray because of the wild goose. There, there is a purpose for you being here. If you missed last week's message, give it a listen. Here's what Luke in the book of Acts describes. When Barnabas arrived and saw what the grace of God had done, he was glad and encouraged them all to remain true to the Lord with all of their hearts. He was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and faith, and a great number of people were brought to the Lord. He was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit. This ministry of Barnabas, this ministry of encouragement, comes from being filled with the Holy Spirit. The wild goose sends a gifted, spirit-filled encourager to help this first multiracial, multi-class church to work together. I mean, this is no small assignment. This mission needs Holy Spirit power. By the way, the word encouragement that's used to describe a Barnabas, in the Greek, it's the word para. Kaleo. The meaning is a little different than what you think of when you hear the English word encouragement. In Greek, parakaleo is a combination of two words. The words para, which means to tenderly, sympathetically come alongside, like a paramedic in English, and kaleo, which means to call, as in to call to the truth. Parakaleo means to come alongside and call someone to truth. Biblical encouragement, parakaleo, is a sympathetic, loving insistence upon the truth. As soon as Barnabas turns up in Antioch, man, he just pours out this ministry of encouragement, this, this ministry of truth and love, uh, uh, just wonderfully woven all together, and the people, they just start growing. It's like fertilizer on the soil. Up come the stems, out go the leaves, out come the flowers, down go the roots. Encouragement, parakaleo, is a powerful combination of love and truth, speaking the truth in love. By the way, what does Jesus call the Holy Spirit? Jesus said this to his disciples just before he went to the cross. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever. And that word helper in Greek is parakletos, or you could translate that as comforter or encourager. And parakletos is just kind of another form of parakleto. It's that unique blend of love and truth. Hey, every now and then, not often, we need just a little Greek to better understand our English translations. So the Holy Spirit is a love and truth encourager. So on one hand, we have Paul. He's the guy who busts down the walls of the evil one, who plants churches in enemy territory, who goes where no God-fearing Jew or Christian would ever dare to go. On the other hand is Barnabas. He's the guy who disciples you, you know, gently but very intentionally. Both Paul and Barnabas had a clear sense of their calling that came from their differing God-given identities. Paul understood his identity as a missionary apostle, and Barnabas understood his identity as an encourager who gently but firmly leads people to a deeper experience of Jesus. Their God-given wirings and identities were not the same, and because they're human, with, with sinful human natures, they allowed their different identities and their differing approaches to ministry to lead to conflict. That's just a human reality. But the good news is, they did eventually reconcile he hears what Paul says while he's in a Roman prison. Only Luke is with me. Get Mark and bring him with you because he is helpful to me in my ministry. You see, Christians, full of the Holy Spirit, forgive. They reconcile. They, they figure things out. Paul swallowed his pride and figured out that John Mark had a lot more to give than what he had originally appreciated. That happened because Barnabas ministered out of his calling, out of his identity as an encourager. And if there had been no Barnabas, what would have happened to John Mark? And would the gospel of Mark that he wrote ever have been written? And the gospel that Mark wrote, 
It served as the foundation for what Matthew, Luke, and John would write after Mark. There are a lot of dominoes here. The bottom line is this. You have a name, or maybe better said, you have an identity that is uniquely yours that comes from Jesus. You may not get a new name like Barnabas did or other characters in the Bible did. Sure, Paul also had the name Saul, but that wasn't a new name. They're just kind of interchangeable names. Saul is his name in Hebrew and Paul is his name in Greek. Same name. What changes for Paul is his title, his identity. He becomes Paul the Apostle. Hey, when you ground your identity in Jesus, when you allow Jesus to fill you with the Holy Spirit, he will gift you to make a difference in this world. No matter what your job or profession or whatever it is you do, he will give you a calling within that. He will give you an identity and you will come to understand what your mission is in your home, on your street, where you work as you connect deeply with the Spirit. It will be unique to you. Now, I tend to think that more of you will likely be called to be more like Barnabas than to be like Paul. More of you will be given the gift of encouragement, gently, wisely speaking the truth with love. A few of you will be given the gift of being a missionary apostle, a little more bold, a little more in your face. And there are many other gifts of the Spirit that God can give that shape your identity, that in turn shapes how you make a difference in this world. My point is, your identity empowered by the Spirit, gives your life direction and purpose, no matter what it is you're doing right now. Purpose where you work. Purpose for the street that you live on. Purpose for the church that you're a part of. And hey, I just want you to know, God, he looks at you with pleasure. He, he made you. He's, he's got this purpose for you. He, he's made a way for you to achieve your purpose through Jesus and being filled with the Spirit. He's pumped and excited for you. He made no junk. You are not junk. You have a divine purpose to fulfill. And right now, that purpose is here in Fort McMurray or wherever you're listening to this message from. So who is God calling you to be? What, what kind of story does God want to write through your life? What name is he giving you? Maybe he's giving you the name Barnabas. Maybe he'll give you the name Paul or Mary, or Martha, or Ruth, or Deborah? Will you take time? This is, this is your homework. Will you take time this week to ask God these questions? Take time, be still before God, and ask him, and, and, and then listen for his voice. God, who are you calling me to be? And God, how does Fort McMary fit into the story of what you want to write through my life? Why on earth am I here? Because, friends, God's got an answer for you. And it might not be a safe and comfortable answer. The wild goose doesn't always play it safe. But the answer he has for you is awesome, and it's the only way to experience life to the full. Okay, let's pray. And ask God to speak to us about the story that he wants to write through our lives, the purpose that he has for us right here and right now where he has us. Will you join me and, and take this prayer and, and make this your own prayer? So kind of pray this along with me. Father God, my creator, I, I thank you that you uniquely put me together to serve your purposes in this day. Today, I, I, I commit my life to you, serving your purposes where I work, in my home, through my church. Come, Holy Spirit, and fill me. Come, Holy Spirit, and, and show me who you have made me to be. Show me who you call me to be and, and lead me every day, every day to make a difference for you. God, would you so work in my life that others would actually see Jesus in me and be drawn to you and choose to follow you. Take my life and let it be powerfully used for your glory. I pray in Jesus' name, amen. of love that's calling There's a chair that waits for you And a friend who understands everything you're going through You keep standing
standing at a distance in the shadows of your shame there's a light of hope that's shining won't you come and take your Again, this week, as I do every week, is there something on your heart that our prayer team could be praying with you about? Are you struggling with what your story looks like right now, what it could be, but it isn't yet? And with the roadblocks that maybe you are experiencing in life right now, I just encourage you to message us with all of that so that we can pray, so that our prayer team can pray with you. I tell you the best resource, the strongest resource we have for you as a part of this church family is our prayer team. Please don't be afraid to message us with your prayer requests. And in closing, let me leave with you an ancient blessing that during this pandemic has become really popular to sing. It goes this way. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. We usually stop there. But, but that's not even the best part. The best part is actually what comes next. So they will put my name on the Israelites and I will bless them. Friends, God doesn't just rename us. He puts his name on us. There are more than 400 names for God in the Bible. Which one does he put on us? All of them. This is how God changes your life. This is how God changes your story. He, he changes our name, which changes our identity, which changes our destiny. Go this week. Spend time with God and discover the name, the identity that, that God has for you. And ask for the Holy Spirit then to fill you and empower you to live out of that identity. And remember, when God looks at you, he is pleased because he knows what your life story 
what you can be. I think this is going to be an amazing week for some of you as you discover the name, the identity that God has for you. And I'd love to hear from you what God is speaking to you. Have a great week and God bless.